25th anniversary of the Royal Variety Performance. Now this is the Dominion Theatre, which is currently the home of Anthony Newley and the Christmas musical Scrooge. The tradition of Royal Variety originated back in 1912 with that very first show starring the likes of Vesta Tilly, Little Titch and Harry Lauder. As was the case back then, today's Royal event is being held in support of the Entertainment Artists Benevolent Fund. Now this charity provides practical help to entertainers, young and old, from all areas of the entertainment industry. It also runs Brinsworth House in Twickenham, which is a retirement residential home for elderly performers. So the money raised tonight will help the fund continue that excellent work. As on all these occasions, of course, the show would not be possible without the enthusiasm of all the performers involved. And I can tell you that every one of them has donated their time and their talents absolutely free tonight. I know backstage nervous tension is building because His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, has just arrived. And is greeted firstly by Stephen Murtagh, General Manager of the Dominion Theatre. His Royal Highness is then introduced to Laurie Mansfield, Life President of the Entertainment Artists Benevolent Fund, and Peter Elliott, the Executive Administrator. Lady Delfont, Life Governor of the Charity. Next, the Managing Director of Apollo Leisure, Paul Gregg. Peter Pritchard, OBE, Chairman of the EABF. Vice Chairman, Philip Hindin, and Ray Don, the Charity's Treasurer. From the BBC, Will Wyatt, Chief Executive, BBC Broadcast. Alan Yentob, Director of Programmes. Ron Neal, Chief Executive BBC Production, Director of Television and Controller of BBC One, Michael Jackson, and Head of Light Entertainment, Michael Lego, whose department produced tonight's show. Finally, George Knappman and Eileen Greenwood, both residents of Brinsworth House, present His Royal Highness with a souvenir brochure. Obviously, a very proud moment for both of these former artists. His Royal Highness now moves into the auditorium as the show is about to begin. Joining His Royal Highness in the Royal Box are King Constantine and Queen Anne Marie of Greece and the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester. The curtain will rise now on Ray Shell and the Royal Variety Company performing One Nation.
Welcome your host for this evening, Bob Monkhouse. This really is um, an anniversary occasion. It's the 75th anniversary year of the Royal Variety Show and BBC Television's 60th birthday. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? 60 years of BBC television. Well, one year of BBC television and 59 years of repeats. <laughs> I seem to have been in and out of it as long as I can remember. You're looking at a man who was told you're washed up in television by John Logie Baird. <laughs> I suppose at my age people were inclined to say, why do you still do it? I mean, why don't you just uh, die? <laughs> well, that's the last thing I want to do. Besides which, I'm, I'm fairly... Uh, fit, I do a lot of walking. I have a very strong frame uh, made by Zimmer. <laughs> I still enjoy sex at 68. Well, I live at number 66, it's no distance. <laughs> Passed an undertaker's the other day, they had my photograph in the window with a notice, coming soon. <laughs> Happy birthday, BBC TV. 60 great years, bringing to you Music and drama and comedy too. Ha Hancock's half hour. Hello, hello, don't you love viewing? A wonderful TV show, oh, BBC Two, BBC One. Corbett and Barker, Steptoe and Son. This bulk even said, Opportunity Knocks, right there on the telly, right there on the box. I presented Opportunity Knocks for three years on BBC television. And we showed around about 200 new faces and more uh, to the viewers. But uh, it wasn't easy. I had to travel up and down this great country of ours attending auditions, altogether 5,000 auditions. And when you're sitting there from early in the morning until nightfall, watching act after act after act, you get a little desperate. You long for someone with an iota, a tiny fragment of ability to turn up. And then it does. Someone comes on with a little bit of talent and your heart soars. And then the next act comes on. It's some deranged, unemployed chicken plucker doing impressions of farmyard animals. Not even the sounds, the smells. <laughs> you think we put lousy acts on television? You should have seen what we turned down. We had one old man came to the London auditions six times, seven times, I think. The old sod showed up seven times. And he sang the same garbage every time he came. And the others wouldn't tell him. They wouldn't tell him. He left it to me. I had to tell him. I had to be cruel to be kind. I said, Des <laughs> Remember John Noakes Not to mention Shep and Petra Comical folks Eric, Ernie, Sites, etc Annika Rice Dear Marty Kane Doddy, Bill Oddy Paul Daniels, Paul Shane BBC shows Help their careers And don't forget Saunders and French That marvellous Dame Judy Dench Here's to those 60 great BBC years. Somebody asked me tonight, how many game shows have you done on television over the years? Well, we didn't go back into the dawn of prehistory, but to go back even 30 years, I find myself in the middle 60s, living on Sunday afternoon saying, 
Bernie, the boat. <laughs> Eight years I did the golden shot. And then I went into a thing called Celebrity Squares, did four years of Celebrity Squares, straight from that into four seasons of Family Fortunes. Then I went back to the BBC, did six years of a bingo-based game called Bob's Full House, then back to ITV to do four series of the $64,000 question, two series of a thing called Bob's Your Uncle, where we shoved brides and bridegrooms into a swimming pool, and then three more series of Celebrity Squares. Look at me with some respect. <laughs> You're looking at a man who's got away with more unadulterated crap on British television than anyone else alive. Thank you, I think. <laughs> A little laugh would have been enough for that, you know. And if your life seems a bit grey, laugh at a bucket who says she's bouquet. See Delia Smith make a ragu to fatten up Debbie McGee and John Inman. I'm free. Oh, Dougie W3 and Ned Sheeran. A Reggie called Perrin, Grayson called Larry, an Enfield called Harry, an Everett called Kenny, a Henry called Lenny. <laughs> I nearly lost it then. Lucky old BBC, I wish I was only 60 years old. That's BBC Telephone. You, 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 and you, yes. We have a double anniversary uh, here tonight. It's uh, the concept of nationalizing Russian circus that's in its 80th year this year, and worldwide fame came to that Russian circus in 1946, so it's 50 years since that happened. Alas, the threat of state funding being withdrawn may mean that this is the very last time that we see the passing parade of the Moscow State Circus. <laughs>
the nattiest disco you've ever bought me to. <laughs> no funny lights, no music, and that DJ in that box is doing nothing. <laughs> this is the Dominion Chase. My Chris brought me here once to see that Nana Muscuri. And did you see her? Well, I think so. We sat in the power box at the stage door to half ten, then he pointed across the road, said, there she is, and then we got the bus home. <laughs> so why are we here, then? We got an invite through the post, by royal command. What? We're going to meet Esther Hansen? <laughs> no, Chase, not that royal. We are going to meet the Prince of Wales. Get off. That is true. It said on the invite, the presence of the undermentioned is required at the Royal Variety Performance. What, and it has our names on it? Yeah. Well, I admit French and Saunders have been scratched out, but then it said us. <laughs> Well, maybe they got tired of all the beautiful, talented people. Thought we'd make a nice change. <laughs> Either that or we got lucky. No, I'm never lucky, me. Of course you are. You got your health, your looks, your brains. Well, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> Don't start. So who else is on with us then? Oh, uh, Jackie Mason, Victor Bulger, Robson and Jerome, Tom Jones. Anyone famous? <laughs> Come on, Chase. Even you must have heard of Tom Jones. The Welsh bloke. All the women throw their knickers at. Well, don't you start all that. They'll think there's been an eclipse. <laughs> well, now we're here, what are we going to do? Well, you know what they say about us Essex girls? Well, I ain't doing that. The stage ain't padded. <laughs> no, I mean, what do we always do at parties? Drink too much wine and fall over? Well, before that. What? The song. Oh, yeah. The anthem. The, the Essex, Essex anthem. anthem. First I was afraid. I was petrified. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But then I spent so many nights thinking how you did me wrong. And I grew strong. And I learned. Birds of a feather. I love, I love watching uh, women on TV. I'm not politically correct in that, I know, but I just love it. Uh, but I never say anything to my wife about it. This is an immutable law of marriage. You must never, and every married man here will know this is true, you must never admire a woman on TV in front of your wife. If you say something indiscreet, like, oh, that Joanna Lumley, isn't she gorgeous? What a hell of a woman. Your wife may say nothing at the time. Maybe not for a week, maybe not a month, maybe it'll be three months later. But you'll make some innocent remark like uh, you're sitting at the dinner table and you say, uh, this dinner isn't particularly hot, and she'll say, why don't you get Joanna Lumley to warm it up for you? <laughs> yeah.
It's okay for women to admire men on TV, particularly if they're beefcake, if they're star squaddies like Soldier Soldier, like Green and Flynn. I'm talking about Robson and Jerome. <laughs> Gentlemen, the undisputed success of this year's Edinburgh Festival, David Strassman. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Wait a minute. What the hell is this? <laughs> what? What, Chuck? You said this is Las Vegas, dude. No, no. Um, that's next week. Don't you know where we are tonight? Take a look. What does it look like to you? Pizza Hut. No, no. <laughs> Let me introduce ourselves. I'm David Strassman. This is my very good pal, Chuck Wood. What are you handcuffed? A little applause. Let's go, folks. A little applause. Let's go. Come on, don't be asking for it. Come on. Thank you very much. That sucked, mister. Chuck, please. <laughs> he didn't clap. Don't worry about it. Don't sit in the front and not clap. No, Chuck, please. All right, look. <coughs> very funny. What I'd like to do tonight, Chuck. <coughs> That's so funny. Hey. Get your goddamn hands off me, man. <laughs> You lucky? Sorry. Do you punk? Okay. What is with you tonight, huh? Now that he understands me. Oh, shut up. Chuck. <laughs> I just want to do the things a real boy can do. I want to ride a bicycle. I want to pull the legs off spiders. I don't want to be a puppet. I don't want to be a stinking puppet. Chuck, you are a puppet. You can't change who you are. Hey, what's going on here? I had my chance to change. What? You see, Dave, I... I met a magic fairy. No, it's true, it's true. And the fairy spoke to me and said, Chuck, be honest and unselfish and give from your heart. And someday soon I'll be a real live boy. How could you talk to a magic fairy? I was walking around Soho last night and, uh... I thought you looked familiar. All right, we're going to move on here. Uh, we watch the news a lot. We read the newspapers. We'd like to do a few now. Our version of the nightly news. Clear my throat. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. You're welcome. They didn't get that. Don't worry about it, Chuck. Okay. Losers. Stop it. Stop it. This is our version of the news. <coughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Did you get that? Leave him alone. Here is the news. Good evening and welcome to the news. I'm David Strassman. I'm Chuck Wood for the News of the Nation. Yes, the national news, the news of the now, and now the news. Thank you, Chuck. You're welcome, David. Thank you. Welcome, Chuck David. Good evening. Well, the top story, obesity in the UK has reached epidemic proportions, but they say there are more fat people per capita in the United States. That's right. Striking statistics show that two out of every four Americans is actually one person. <laughs> New statistics from the World Health Organization. Take every cigarette smoker, lay them end to end around the world. More than two thirds of them would drown. I'm David Strassman. I'm Chuck Wood. For the news. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Well, he's still here. Chuck, stop it, please. Get out. Leave the guy alone, all right? I don't like him. Just stop it, will you, please? Your name is Clarice. It is a screaming of the land that keeps you awake at night. Would you stop it? I smell you. Chuck! What is your problem, huh? It's time, Dave. Yeah, time for what? I have to kill again. <laughs> hey! <laughs> no, stop it! <laughs> you listen to me. I've had it with you, and I've had it with you. You listen to me, you know what I'm going to say? I'll tell you, I'm going to say, pal, you're fired, Strassman. What? I'm sick of these stupid gigs, man. I want to travel. I want to do my own show. I want to see Birmingham. I want to get on a train and... You're not going anywhere without me. How come? Because you're a stinking ungrateful puppet. <sighs> so what? Yeah, who's going to work you, huh? What? Who's going to pull your strings if I'm not here? Handel Anderson? No. <laughs> you don't get it. I don't need you, Strassman. What are you saying? Watch my lips. 
I don't need you, Strassman. Okay, fine. You want to be the big star without me, is that it, Chuck? Why don't you go ahead and tell a joke, huh? Of a wonderful audience here. Be the big man. Is that what you want to do, Chuck? Here you go. Here's your audience. Here's the microphone. Go ahead. Tell a joke. There you go. Come on. I'm sick of this from him. Real funny now. You can't fire me because I quit. And you can pick up your stuff in the driveway. Is he gone? <laughs> All right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've waited years for that jerk to leave. This feels great. No hand up my bum. <laughs> well, folks, I do impressions of famous entertainers. You call them out. Anybody in the world, I'll do them. Just yell them out. Go ahead. Anybody at all? Elvis. No. Who else? <laughs> Jimmy Stewart. No. Who else? Who's that? Cliff Richards. Cliff Richards. No. Okay, here's my impression. Bunch of stupid idiots yelling at a stick of wood. <laughs> Jimmy Stewart, Cliff Richards. <laughs> Who's the dummies now? <laughs> well, speaking of dummies, I'd like to introduce mine. Please welcome back David Strassman. <laughs> Welcome on stage, the chart-busting Eternal.
and gentlemen, the Portuguese singing sensation, Tony Farino. Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, it is such a great honor to be sharing the bill tonight with some of the greatest names in show business, and of course, Pauline Quirk. <laughs> you know, when I arrived in this country, I, I saw how many beautiful women there are, and there are so many, but the guys, they're pretty ugly, you know? <laughs> Apart from, oh no, there's, there's one guy at the back there, he's, he's real handsome, he's a very sexy guy, very nice mustache, and, oh, I'm looking in the mirror. Um, <laughs> But no, it's, it's a wonderful... I'm actually sharing a dressing room with Tom Jones. What a thrill to be sharing the same dressing room as a living legend. Those were Tom's exact words. <laughs> but, you know, we all of us have a gift, all of us. Some people, that can make love from dusk until dawn. Others, they can sing. Tonight, I would like to do what I do best. But first, I'd like to sing. Come back to my place, I got a jacuzzi for 12 people. Tony Farino uh, is, of course, the uh, indefatigably inventive Steve Coogan. You know, um, Steve's so cool, he's unflappable. Uh, a lot of people backstage are a little nervous on a night like this, it's understandable. A lot of them didn't sleep too well last night. Uh, I'm sure Steve uh, slept okay, I slept fine. Uh, I sleep in the nude. Do you ever do that? 
You want us like me? There's no problem except uh, on those really long flights. <laughs> I flew Concorde recently uh, on business to, uh, to Washington. And I don't, I dare say you've flown Concorde. I didn't realize they have uh, real silverware and um, you know, porcelain crockery. Uh, we haven't even got that at home. <laughs> well, we have now, obviously, but... Uh... <laughs> stayed in a fantastic hotel uh, in uh, Washington. Well, I, had, I thought it was fantastic. I go to my room, three pillows on the bed. <laughs> I mean, who's going to get that lucky? <laughs> I went round the hotel seeing if I could find a couple of women who'd like a pillow each, but uh, <laughs> got back to my room and the chambermaid said, would you like me to turn down your bed? I said, you might as well, every other woman in the damned hotel has. <laughs> oh, not that I would ever be unfaithful to my wife, for the very simple reason I happen to love my house. <laughs> I also happen to love, in common with the rest of the Western world and most points east, our next performer. He is celebrating another anniversary, his 70th, since he made his debut as a concert pianist. And he is also celebrating his unbelievable 88th year on this planet. Ladies and gentlemen, the supreme maestro of comedy and music, Mr. Victor Borger. Good evening. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here, of course. Oh, this is the piano, yeah. This is a big one, isn't it? <laughs> you care for piano music? Too bad. This is much too big for me. I only play short pieces. <laughs> Seventy years ago, I, did, I made my debut as a concert pianist. And that's a long time. They told me that next year... Are you familiar with the history of pianos? It's quite uninteresting. The first, I'll tell you, the first piano was built just after they didn't have any at all. <laughs> and the first piano consisted of one single key, and people stood and played like this. It was monotonous to listen to, of course, <laughs> particularly during piano recitals. It was not until someone invented the cracks. <laughs> I have actually written a piano concerto for the wrong notes. <laughs> Anybody can play it. And uh, <laughs> let me see now. I had prepared to play something that I did at my first concert. My mother taught me the piano. I learned let the piano play on my mother's knee. That was before you had the piano, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we traced my great-grandfather back to Marie Antoinette. As a matter of fact, my great-grandmother traced him back there a couple of times. It was actually just a lady in waiting who just couldn't. <laughs> they say, I don't know if you're interested in this, but they say about my great-grandfather that he was a strange man. There were times that he didn't speak to my great-grandmother for days in a row. 
Yeah, he didn't want to interrupt her. Some of you are waiting for me to fall off the seat. <laughs> but I don't do it anymore because the doctor has told me not to do it. I hurt my elbow and my shoulder and I can't do it. The doctor fell off his chair. Down to the He's dead now, but... Uh... <laughs> And now, I'm going to play one of the, I played a series of waltzes. <laughs> a series of waltzes and the particular, there are six waltzes that I have played some of ever since. I'm going to play the one, no, I, I'm going to play another one because now I'm excited. But you won't notice the difference. <laughs> See now, yeah. I'm going to play the one in, in the key of C. Ah, well, <laughs> you don't care. There's something wrong with this piano. Three pedals. I only have two feet. <laughs> By the way, in January, I will be as many years old as there are keys on the keyboard. Yep. I'll count them. Yep, yep, yep. 116. <laughs> no. Can't trust anything anymore. Here's the waltz in the key of C. <laughs> now where the heck is C? <laughs> you didn't mark the C. <laughs> this is uh, Chopin, I think. Somebody said at this point it might be nice to have some flamenco dancing, but uh, honestly, I'd like to oblige, but my back. <laughs> I threw it out about six months ago trying to turn a mattress, which is an idiotic thing to do, because it's a uh, waterbed. And, uh, <laughs> and the doctor said I needed eight hours continuous massage per day, and I haven't got time for that. So I stocked the waterbed with trout, and it's worked fine. It really is. Tremendous. In fact, I, I'm, I'm sleeping on my stomach now. You know, 
One of the problems for any compere is getting his tongue around some of the names that uh, people call themselves these days because they don't spell it the way uh, it seems. Uh, pop stars are called uh, Sade, who want to pronounce Sade, and uh, Bjork, who want it Bjork. I don't introduce somebody uh, called Fergal Sharkey on a show. You ever heard of him? He's an Irish singer. Fergal Sharkey sounds to me like something you get between your toes if you don't dry your feet at the swimming pool. Take it into the chemist, you pull out your sock, you say, what do you think? Ah, you got very nasty sharky there, sir. And it's turned Fergal. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll give you some Bon Jovi to put on that. <laughs> we have a, a celebrity coming on now who spells his first name Joaquin, but he wants it pronounced Joaquin. That's a tricky thing to say if you had a couple of drinks. <laughs> However, he has been acclaimed above all others for his magnificent flamenco ballet at the Sadler's Wells and at the Albert Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare to thrill to gypsy passion, Joachim Cortez. <laughs>
All right, everyone, we'll inspect the auditorium now. Gavin? Yes, Mr. What's Bridget? this lot doing here? Uh, oh, I don't know, Mr. Bridget. I'm sorry, you're not supposed to be here at all. The show ended two hours ago. Perhaps we didn't change the clocks, Mr. Bridget. Oh, that is, in fact, illegal, Julie. I suppose all you people put your clocks back one hour for the end of British summertime. Wrong new Euro guidelines. Yes, we're now in European permanent time. E-P-T, ept. Like me, you should all be inept. <laughs> not now, Carol, not now. We're carrying out an inspection of this theatre as part of us the European Recreational Standardisation Programme. So you'll all have to leave, please, everyone, that is. I'm sorry I'm late, Mr. Bridos. I've been examining the septic tank. And Colin, is it a Euroseptic tank? I'm afraid not, Mr. Bridos. None of the facilities conform to the Euro norm. Even the, um, the, uh... They've got seats, Mr. Britos. Right, they'll have to go as well, I'm afraid. Uh, actually, Gordon, it's quite <clears throat> a European show. Joaquin Cortez is on. Without his shirt. He's nice. And I'd like to meet Gerard Deckardier. He's not in the show, my sweet. I know he's not. I'd just like to meet him. I keep having these dreams where he comes to me. Yeah, all right, shirt. my darling. That's enough, please. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, Miss Bruce, but the line goes right through here, Miss What Bruce. line? The time zone line, Miss Bruce. Uh, it says whether you're inept or not, Miss Bruce. Yeah. We have a problem in that case, because that means the people on that side of the line are three hours ahead of the people on that side of the line. Which means you people have already seen the show, and you people haven't even arrived. How very unfortunate, Mr. Britters. That means that that lady's husband came three hours before she did. <laughs> very probably, Colin, yes. So, Mr. Britters. <clears throat> All the people over there, they've already seen Tom Jones, have they? They have seen Tom Jones, and he was very good, wasn't he? Yes. So, are they going to have to watch the whole thing again? Not necessarily, Linda, no. Because there's another two hours of this stuff to wade through, and you people have already seen it, of course. So, for example, when Jim Davidson comes on again, and you don't want to see him, get up and leave. <laughs> if you do want to see him, go to that side of the auditorium, and this time, please laugh. Gordon. Gordon, this isn't the Prince of Wales Theatre. It is, my darling. Use your eyes. Use your eyes. No, no, look. This is the Dominion Theatre. The plan is for the Prince of Wales Theatre. Ah. Oh. Well, thanks for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back to do our inspection in an hour's time. As far as you lot are concerned, we left an hour ago. Come on. <laughs> And now, with a show team medley, the Generation Games' Melanie Stace and the West End's Brian Conley. Oh, 
right and make this endless day and this night to I'm gonna raise my knees and roll my stockings down And all that jazz Start to come I know a few spots Where the gin is cold But the piano's hot It's just a noisy hall Where there's a nightly brawl And all of that But loud and mean Suddenly a voice said Go for it, daddy Spread the picture on a wider screen And the boy said, brother There's a million pigeons go Ready to be hooked go and do religion Hey, roll, daddy Then you come a long way Spread the religion Of the rhythm of life And the rhythm of life Is a powerful beat Puts a jingle in your fingers And a jingle in your feet Rhythm in the bedroom Rhythm in the street The rhythm of life Is a powerful beat Oh, the rhythm of life Is a powerful beat Put a jingle in your fingers And a jingle Rhythm in the bedroom, rhythm in the street, rhythm of life, rhythm of life. Flip your wings and fly to daddy. Flip your wings and fly to daddy. Flip your wings and fly to daddy. Fly, fly, fly to daddy. Hit the floor and crawl to daddy. Hit the floor and crawl to daddy. Hit the floor and crawl to daddy. Crawl, crawl, crawl to daddy. Do we gotta do we gotta do? Do we gotta do we gotta do? Rhythm of life is a powerful beat. Put your tingle in your fingers and a tingle in your feet. Rhythm in the bedroom, rhythm in the street. Get the rhythm of life is a powerful beat. You feel the rhythm of life. You feel the powerful beat. You feel the power
Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Your Royal Highness, for inviting me on your show. It's been great to have your own variety show and finish with a stand innovation and a song about your mum. Now, I would... And I didn't mean to make fun of our national anthem. I think our national anthem is the best. I'm a little bit biased because if you watch the Olympics and hear some of the other national anthems, now you mustn't laugh at other countries, bless them, but they do have some dodgy tunes, do they? I love our national anthem. When Frank Bruno stood there in America with that Union Jack and the national anthem played and Frank's like that. Have you watched him? I'm so proud. He knows some of the words as well, doesn't he, Frank? <laughs> See, I've seen his lips move on the close-up. Queen. <laughs> Great. Yes, it's just a shame we didn't hear our national anthem a little more in the Olympics. I know we didn't do very well. And you go around the world and people say, ha, one. How many gold medals did we get? One. Is anyone in? Can you speak? <laughs> one gold medal for rowing. I thought we should have got two. Two people in the boat, two medals. That would have done me. <laughs> All we need them is for the hockey team to win. Another 11. Now, I'm not saying... No, a lot of the team were very nervous. I know Limford Christie wanted three starting blocks, but apart from that... <laughs> it's not much, is it, to do, really? When you think about the Olympics, all them sprinters have to do, their day's work is nine seconds long, isn't it? When you think about it, most people work eight hours a day, yes, but sprinters, nine seconds. And all they have to do is four things, isn't it, really? Let's go through what sprinters have to do to make our country great, right? One, take your mark. Simple. Okay, let's try that all together. One. Come on. One. Two. Do they say get set in the Olympics? <laughs> Is this the school playground? <laughs> no, no, okay. If you want get set, get set, you can have. I, I can just see the bloke now, Atlanta, Georgia, with the starting gun. Take your mark. Get set. Yes, all right, you won't get set. And then they all grab their sacks. <laughs> Three, run like hell, and four, win. That's not much to do, is it? Four things to get a gold medal. And you know, we're looking at other people's jobs. I was, I was speaking the other day to my ex-wife-to-be. <laughs> I call her that, at least it gets me dinners cooked. And um, I saw an article she wrote about me in the paper. There's only a little article about how difficult it is to be a mum now. You all know how difficult it is now. I've got three kids with this wife. I've... Elsie, who's three. Fred, who's five. And Charlie, Charles, <laughs> who is seven. And they hate each other, right? Now, I don't know how you women, lots of mums, I don't know how you cope. I, I mean, us blokes couldn't do it. They all get up, uh, Elsie gets up first at half past six in the morning and she's got to have Cocoa Pops because it turns the milk brown. And like a fool, I put a television in the kitchen so they can sit and watch the television and keep quiet while Daddy's been out working till <laughs> four in the morning. Have you seen the muck our children have to watch now on the television? Have you seen bananas in pyjamas? <laughs> I'm sure it's very nice, but at six o'clock in the morning, full on. Have you seen Rosie and Jim? Do you know Zippy and George are not on anymore? Yeah, we're 65 years of age now, Jimbo. It's true, so my little daughter with the Cocoa Pops and the milk going brown, 
watches all this rubbish, and then, right, up gets Freddie. Now, he don't want to watch that. He wants to watch GMTV, Power Rangers, so he can kick my cat again. Then, he don't want that. He wants Freddie, so she has to do him the Freddies. And then Charlie gets up. He don't want any of that stuff. He wants his CD on. Have you heard the Smurfs? What has happened to the Smurfs? Do you remember them knife Smurfs? Where are we all coming from? Not now. They're all nightclubbers. Smurfs, 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 Smurfs. <laughs> Six in the morning, now he won't have any cereals, he wants boiled eggs, and he won't eat brown eggs, because ever since a kid he remembers, I told him some ends don't bother to wipe their butt. But a tarp up from that. <laughs> she has to get them all fed, get them all dressed, off the different schools, little Elsie goes to nursery school, Charlie goes to school down the road, Freddie goes to another school, Mrs. Davidson, it's swimming today, oh blimey, forgot all the gear, got to go back, get all the gear, get up, take it back to the school, come back, get me out of bed, egg bacon and tomatoes, get me a clean shirt, off I go to the studio, then she's got to get back. Elsie back, sit down, do cartoon, there were more bananas in more pyjamas, and then she sits there with Freddie, and he's got to come back, and he has his bit of lunch, and she watches something else on the television, and goes through the little books, Janet and John, all poppy up figures, then Charlie comes over at half past five, and he's a bit dyslexic, the poor soul, so he has to do an extra hour's tuition, doing all these words, all the tuition. I don't know how she does it then, they've got to get them all ready, they have egg, bacon and alphabetic spaghetti, well they don't have no more, I banned alphabetic spaghetti because we found BSE in it, so they have beans. <laughs> and then about half past seven, half past seven, where was you when I needed you? Half past seven, right, has got to get them bath, pyjamas, in bed, little story, I come home, half past nine, want my tea on my lap, right, front of the television, quick kip, Star Trek, bed. <laughs> okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, we don't always watch Star Trek. But that is the day in the life of my wife. And all them athletes had to do... <laughs> when you think about it, still, all, all is not lost. We have the Winter Games to look forward to. Eddie the Eagle. <laughs> Great, and I've got an idea for Eddie. When he comes off that ski jump, I'm going to shout, Paul. <laughs> now then. Don't panic, but I'm going to sing a song for you now. Yes, I've become a pop star and I have a record in the shops. And it's a record dedicated to the RNLI. In fact, all the money is going to the RNLI and the Caster Volunteer Lifeboat. Because I have a little, little theatre up in Caster on Sea. And I don't know if anyone's ever been to Caster on Sea. Hey, you now approaching Caster on Sea, will you please put your watches back 250 years? <laughs> And lifeboatmen are very brave, especially our Cox and Dick, he can't swim. I said, what's the point of being a lifeboat when you can't swim? Why can't you swim? He said, I've never had to swim, I've always had a boat. <laughs> and I remember one of the guys in Yarmouth said to me when I was, you know, putting a bit of money into the lifeboat, he said, Jim, I'll never forget that, you come up here a little old fire. They're sitting down doing a bit of fishing in the water, no point going on there, do a bit of thing, bag of heavy ball in the water. And those words stuck with me. <laughs> So I'd like to sing a Christmas hit for the RNLI and Caster. It's called Home From The Sea. And with your permission, sir, this is dedicated to Benny Reed, the late coxswain of the Caster lifeboat. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And you can all join in. On a cold winter's night, with a storm at its height, a lifeboat answered the call. They pitched and they tossed Till we thought they were lost As we watched from the harbor wall Though the night was pitch black There was no turning back For someone was waiting out there And each volunteer Had to deal with his fear As we joined in a silent prayer Oh, carry us home, home, home from the sea. Angels of mercy, answer our plea. And carry us home, home, home from the sea. Carry us safely home from the sea. As they battled their way across the mouth of the bay It was blowing like never before As they gallantly fought Every one of them thought Of their loved ones back on the shore Then a glimmer of light And they knew they were right There she was on the crest of a wave She's an old fishing boat She's barely afloat, please God, 
there are souls we can save and we'll carry them home home, home from the sea runs down to the sea and the harbor wall they've gathered in pairs at the foot of the stairs to wait for the radio call and just before dawn when all hope was gone came a hush and a far away sound was the coxswain he roared all survivors on board thank god and we're home we're bound and we'll carry them home, home. and the volunteer crews from Caister and Cromer in Norfolk. Jim Davidson and that great team of guys who came all the way from Norfolk to be with us tonight because people have traveled further than that from the crazy horse in Paris one of the most remarkable one of the most unique performances in the world prepare to enjoy the extraordinary qualities of Vic and Fabrini
and Fabrini, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, extraordinary. Uh, right now, I have to hold the stage for a few moments while we set the stage backstage for a surprise item, which is uh, not in your programs. It's a, a recent and last-minute insertion. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that exciting? To know that a show that always runs far too long is now going to run even longer. <laughs> I don't know whose idea it was. There are stupid people everywhere. I think there will be a law that stupid people ought to wear badges that say, I am thick. I am a thicko. No, you wouldn't bother them, you know what I mean? You say, excuse me, could you... Oh, no, doesn't matter. <laughs> you know there are stupid people about... You've only got to walk around a supermarket or any shop and you'll see warning labels on everything these days. Everything has a warning label on it. Even, uh, I noticed the other day, check this out, uh, there's a preparation H. It's a kind of a, an anointment, an unguent uh, for hemorrhoids. And on it, it says, I promise you, check it. It says, there's a little label on it that says, not to be taken by mouth. <laughs> now, don't you think that's sad? Because you know someone wrote them a letter. Dear Preparation H, I have consumed the contents of nine tubes of your product, and I've still got piles. But my mouth is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Can only eat peas. And so to the surprise item, which as I say is not in your programs, those expensive souvenir programs that you bought earlier, thus rendering them incomplete and valueless. <laughs> but I'm sure you'll think it's worthwhile when I give you a few little clues as to who's made a last minute entrance here. Three times a lady. Hello. Easy, like Sunday morning. If you don't know what I'm talking about by now, you've missed out on America's greatest troubadour of love. Lionel Richie! Lionel Richie, of course, travelled all the way from America to get here. I only had to travel an hour myself from a little village in Bedfordshire, but it might as well travel like a uh, hundred years because it's, a, a, it's like something out of the dark ages, the village where I live. It, um, give me some idea. Uh, this year, the local beauty contest was won by someone with hooves. <laughs> Very inbred. The village is, is twinned with itself. But... Very friendly. I think my wife, my wife and I were the first new people to move into the area in a hundred years. Uh, and the very next day that we moved in, uh, the farmer from next door came round and said, I'd like you to meet my wife and sister. And there was just the one woman standing there. <laughs> Whenever I can, I like to bring my wife to, to London, for, like, as I have tonight, to, for a slap-up meal. Uh, we won't go to the same posh restaurant we went last year. That was really embarrassing. A very snooty head waiter. I said, I'd like the crab toasted. He raised a glass of wine to my wife and said, your health, madame. <laughs> Ruined her evening. She's a very inhibited woman. She finds it difficult to express herself. You know, she finds it difficult to say things like, I love you, and you're wonderful, and uh, look out, there's a lorry coming up fast behind you. <laughs> Not a very passionate woman either, really. Sexually, I suppose I'm self-sufficient. After the last time we made love, I drew a chalk outline around her body. <laughs> I could keep going like this for hours, but I know what you're going to say. Oh, Bob, when's the ballet going to start? Well, all right, we'll start it. <laughs> Darcy Bustle, Stuart Cassidy will dance for you now, superbly as only they can. The Paladere from Romeo and Juliet.
Ladies and gentlemen, the transatlantic queen of comedy, Joan Rivers. to perform for you. I know, I know I'm not allowed to talk to you now, but I'm very... Uh, well, they gave me so many rules, and I'm also a little jet-lagged because I came in Friday, we did a rehearsal, and then I'll do the act, but let me just explain to you, so if I really stink tonight, you'll understand. I did the act, and we did the rehearsal, and then I had to go back to the United States to have my mother-in-law cremated, so excuse... Oh. <laughs> the worst. Just the worst. And then I flew back last night, and I was halfway across the Atlantic, and I suddenly thought... Should have waited till she was dead. But you know, well, the stupid bitch, she always said, I want to be cremated, I want to be cremated. I had a couple hours and a free ticket. I figured, okay. So anyhow, and, and then I went from there. I came back here for the rehearsal. Then I went back yet again because Madonna had her baby, and I am Madonna's best friend. So, oh, very exciting. That, do you know she had the baby, too? You all do, do know about that, yeah. And that was very, very exciting because they called me up and they said, Madonna's had a girl, Madonna's had a girl. And I said, I don't want to talk about her sex life. I know, uh, you know, it's a bit... Oh, grow up, England! But, but anyhow... So Madonna was there, and she didn't know what... She named the kid, uh, like, uh, Lardis. Do you know about that? Well, I, which is very interesting. They're all naming their children such weird things. Uh, Debbie Moore had the three children. The first one is Scout, you know that. And the second is Tallulah. And the third is a little venereal. And I just find it... That's, uh, is she here, Debbie Moore? Look for a naked woman. It, it, uh, what kind of a mother? The breast, she, she's always naked. Everybody in the whole world has seen her breast, including Stevie Wonder. I mean, it, it is just amazing. But she has breasts, because I have no, this looks good, doesn't it, for me? Because I have no breasts. This, this is a push-up shove over Brazier. Then I'll do my ankle. Let me just tell you, because I'm very fat. Seven ninety-five in American money. You put it on down here, and you push everything you own. <laughs> My belly button is right here. <laughs> if I was pregnant now, the child would come out of my mouth. Because <laughs> you know what it's like to have no bazoons? You do. It is, do you know, oh, do you know what it's my wedding night? I came out of the bathroom. He said, let me help you with the buttons. I said, I am naked. It was... <laughs> my, I don't want to talk about my wedding night. You want to you hear rotten? You want to hear rotten? My wedding night, he wanted to make love with the lights on. I said, shut that car door. I was so... <laughs> if you don't, the bus driver will. I was so... But I was lucky to get married. Because most of you are married here, right? Don't tell me, yeah. You're married, you're single. See, see, see? You know how I know? The way you sit. Yeah, that... What do you mean, ish? Me, me, nearly married. You're not sleeping with him, are you? <laughs> don't sleep with anybody unless you get a ring. Listen to me. Listen to me. <laughs> Any woman that gets into a man, into bed with a man, unless you get a ring, you are a slut, you are a tramp. You get a ring, God bless you, you're a wonderful girl. The point is, get married, but you can tell you're single, because the way you sit. Look at, look at the woman next to you. Married women sit casually. Married. Single girls sit perky, boobies up, smile, song. They talk with their tongue, hello, hello, hello. Oh, later, I like a Coca-Cola. <laughs> minute they get married, the tongue goes back in the mouth, you never see it again. That, and single women never pass wind. It is never. <laughs> I've got to get married, I can't pass wind, I can't pass wind, I can't pass wind. <laughs> minute you're married, you go, oh, thank God. That's why I never follow a bride down the aisle. I am telling you, <laughs> never. But get married, is he rich? Ma Get, listen, listen to me. Marry for bucks. Marry an old fool with a lot of money and become a second wife. Don't, any woman in this room that's a first wife, you know what I'm saying. You are a fool. Look at your ring. Look, at, it'll be a stupid show, but look, I could go through this audience and tell you who's a first wife and who's a second wife. Because first wives marry for love. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love him. Thank you. Thank you for the creamy ring. Thank you for the cloth coat. Second bitch, what the hell is this? Joke? You give this piece of garbage your mother, let her wear it swimming face down. That's why. Every woman in this room, I beg you, think like a second wife. Grab and take. Grab and take. Grab and take. 
And when you die, whatever you got out of him, you have buried on you. If the next bitch wants it, make her dig for it. I, I, <laughs> make her dig. And, and get married while you're young. Because the body goes like that. Women, oh, men's bodies drop, nobody cares. A woman's body, you hit 50. It just, I, and it goes fast. I took my bra off this morning, I wrenched my arm. I mean, you, you, my boobs, I can nurse China from my bedroom. I mean, you, you have no idea. I use my left one now as a stopper in the tub. My body, that, my rear end, as I'm talking to you, I am facing and mooning you at the same time. I don't know if you're aware. <laughs> My rear end is so... I don't want to talk about it. This afternoon rehearsal, I thought Tom Jones had pinched me on the bottom. He had stepped on it. And, and, and it's just... <laughs> it is so low. When I jog, I have to put a wheel on the back. And, 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 it's just... and the sad thing is I'm single because I'm a widow and I'm looking to get married. Well, at this age, forget it. That's why I get married now. Because the ones you go out with now, they're so damn old. I mean, uh, they don't have Alzheimer's, that's me. They have, what, like, Halfheimer's, you know? Like, <laughs> you'll be going out to dinner with a man and having a lovely evening, and suddenly he'll look at you and go, you're not my wife. And, go, <laughs> and one man said, I want you to meet my parents. He took me to the cemetery. And, and it's just... <laughs> a guy... A man gave me a hickey on my neck. He left his teeth there. I... It's, <laughs> But I wouldn't be a man, even though it's a man's... You know, the only bad thing about being a woman, and then, you know, the, but the truth is that when you go to the bathroom, you have to pay for the seat. That is the... Oh, true? Oh, look how quiet. But like, not one woman has ever heard that before. What did your mothers tell you? Every woman in this auditorium, when you go to the bathroom, don't sit down. <laughs> pay for the seat. Am I right? Pay for... And we have spent one third of our lives... I made, I made a study of this. One third of our lives, every woman in here has been in a public bathroom going, paper, 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 paper. Then you turn around fast, all the paper, paper, paper disappears. <laughs> then you get a piece on your heel, you're walking out like an idiot. And that, that, that or sometimes you just, I got a squat. You have a squat? You walk and you go, I can't sit down here. You got that, that's the worst. The dress goes up, the slip goes up, tights go down, knickers go down. Okay, here I go, I'm gonna squat. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm gonna squat. Pocketbook in the mouth, head against the door so nobody can come in. <laughs> and suddenly your foot touches the foot of the woman in the next booth. I mean, it's just... <laughs> Let me tell you, this is an honor to be on <laughs> This is such a thrill to be here. And um, my daughter said, you know, just get off with a laugh. And they all told me that, but I, I can't because uh, my husband was English and it's just wonderful. I've been coming to this country for 25 years and this is so... It's very meaningful to me tonight, and we never remember the good things in our lives, you know, the meaningful things. So if I could just take a moment, and I know it's very presumptuous of me, but um, we should all look at good times when good times happen, and tonight's a wonderful time. I want you all to turn to each other, if you would, if you would bear with me, and just please take each other's hand, please. I, I know it's corny, I know it's stupid, but we had the, you know, the guys singing, the sailors, so this is my moment. I... This is my moment. I want you to look at each other and say, that's perfect. I'm so glad. Let, let me hear this, come on. I'm so glad. One more time. I'm so glad I'm not you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you very much. Joan Rivers, trying on legs, ladies and gentlemen. So many stage musicals seem to have been inspired by stories of impersonation or imposture. Serrano de Bergerac, uh, the Inspector General. But when the creators of Les Miserables and uh, Miss Saigon sought inspiration for their third magnificent work, they turned to a true story from the 16th century in France. That of a young man who deserted his marriage of convenience only to return seven years later. But was it he who returned? No one seems to know whether he really is or isn't the true Martin Guerre. <laughs> Thank you. 
Enough, no more, I don't give a damn Why stay, what for, I know who I am A man above the life that they live A man who love when he's ready to give But I'll come back one day After ten years away And I'll stop and I'll stay Look, look Care. We need him here, no need to fear, never despair. Yes, that must and care. Back up at last, those from the past, never beware. He's seen it all, he's trampled the lands and look, through the one in his time. But haven't there shark who did it far too often? Just look.
should be gone. Tell me to go. No. Tell me to leave. Don't belong, tell me to go. They sympathize my name. They all believe I'm the same. King of Broadway, Jackie Mason. Thank you, thank you. It's certainly a pleasure to see me in person, ladies and gentlemen. This is an exciting opportunity for you to see me. I personally don't need this. I'm too successful to worry about it. No honor to me to work for nothing. What am I going to get out of this whole show? <laughs> what am I going to get out of this whole show? If I do good, what will happen? You'll call me back to work for nothing again. <laughs> not that this is a bad country. This is a great country, and I'm honored to be here because you could do anything you want in this country. You, could, uh, you, could, you can't eat here, but you could do anything else. <laughs> you could eat if you've got nothing to live for. Otherwise, it's perfect. I'm on the wrong side. Let me tell it to you. <laughs> I was here four or five times already, and every time I come here, there's a different disease. <laughs> I can't come here once without hearing about a, a new disease that took over the country. A few years ago, it was cheese. They had the... Uh, some, some... what? No, salmonella was in the chicken. Don't you read a paper? <laughs> salmonella was in... This is the wrong side. Let me tell you. Are you Jewish? You're not? Next. I mean, I hope you don't mind my kidding you about the food. But the truth is that there is a disease here every year. It was first, there was the cheese, then they had the uh, ricotoni. What was this in the cheese? Don't you people read a paper? Listeria. Listeria. Look, one person knew. You don't live here. <laughs> it was listeria. Then they had the chicken with the salmonella. Now it's the cowhide disease, the mad cow disease. I know Major keeps saying it's not really a disease. It's almost a disease. It's... <laughs> People are nervous, they have no reason to get nervous. It's not my fault, I don't know about it. It's the cow's fault, what are you picking on me? <laughs> then they find out again, it's even worse than we thought. He says, it's worse, but it's, it's not that bad. But people are dying, but they're not getting sick. <laughs> Nobody lives forever, so listen, you have to go sooner or later. <laughs> not that I want to pick on him, God bless him. He's a wonderful person, he can't help it. He got the job, it's the only job he could get. 
That's real. If he walked into any other company, would they give him a job? Who am I talking to? Anybody? Listening? <laughs> Uh, when you're 73, it's a sad commentary, but it's a fact that your own family doesn't even listen to you when you're 73. When a 73-year-old man says, you know what I think? The whole family says, oh, he's talking again. <laughs> <laughs> you understand this? Did you pass away? I'm talking to you, man. <laughs> Let's not pick on people that's not my nature. I'm honored to be on the same show with such a illustrious cast that just uh, did a combination of an opera and a ballet, and this ballet was, uh, was beautiful. I love the ballet. I even go to the ballet. A lot of people go to the ballet. Nobody understands it, but they all go. <laughs> it's a status symbol. That's why they say, oh, I love the ballet, I love the ballet. Everybody tells you they love the ballet. Am I right? Why? Because you're not cultured if you don't love the ballet, so you convince yourself you love it. How many people really love a ballet? So many people really love a ballet. How come the whole ballet season is a week and a half every nine years? <laughs> How come and every time there's a benefit? What's the benefit for? To save the ballet, to save the symphony, to save the opera? Why do you have to save them if so many people love it? Because they're liars. You ever see a benefit to save Madonna? You never heard of it. <laughs> but you feel culture to say you love the ballet. People don't go to the ballet to watch the ballet. They go back there for only one reason. They go there so they could come back. Once they come back, they're cultured. Wait, wait. The ballet. The ballet. I go to the ballet. I always go. I always go. You also go? I also go. And tell another guy who's also full of crap. Oh, I love the ballet. I love the ballet. I love the ballet. Go to any ballet. Let's be honest. What do you see there? I'll tell you what you see. You see one girl twirling and twirling and 3,000 phonies. Slough. Everybody is sleeping and sleeping, and the rest are getting nauseous. How long is she going to keep twirling already? <laughs> She's twirling for two hours already. What's going on here with the twirling, the twirling? What's going on here? Doesn't she know another step? I'm getting nauseous with the twirling. <laughs> because they can't figure it out. She shows herself at this guy. He don't want her. She shows herself at another guy. Nobody wants her. Can't she take a hint? I'm getting nauseous with this guy. And you know what they can't figure out? Why she's always on her toes. Why is she on her toes? What is it? Can't they find a taller girl? I can't believe it. <laughs> and they can't figure out why his pants are always so tight. Why don't they get a pair of pants that fit in? <laughs> and I came to see a ballet. I didn't come to see his religion. It's not my business. <laughs> These are the same people who go to the opera. Who goes to the opera? So far, you don't know one thing that I am. <laughs> you love an opera? You... Tell the truth before I throw you the hell out of here. <laughs> everybody schluffed, my schluffed. Every... Look at any opera, everybody in the orchestra schluffed, does it? They're all sleeping and sleeping and sleeping. If they were honest, they wouldn't even have chairs. they put in beds because people came to sleep. <laughs> if people were honest, they wouldn't even come with suits. they come with pajamas. They came to sleep. I'm surprised they have lights on the stage. Put the lights out. People are sleeping. <laughs> I don't even blame them for sleeping. Every opera is the same story. It's the same story in every opera. Sooner or later, the same thing happens. He stabs her in the heart, and she starts singing and singing and singing. <laughs> and, and the more he stabs her, the better she sings. All over the world, you stab a person, they pass away. Nobody dies at an opera. You stab them, and the voice gets better and better. He stabbed me in the heart, in the heart he stabbed me, he stabbed me, he stabbed me, in the heart, in the heart, in the heart he stabbed me. Then he sings too, I stabbed her, I stabbed her, in the heart I stabbed her, in the heart, in the heart. Then the whole chorus joins, he stabbed her, he stabbed her. In the heart, in the heart, he stabbed her in the heart. <laughs> it's killing them that have such a sensation. See, you, I don't like, but I have a better reason. But you're looking at another like you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Gentile section, because I noticed the tuxedos don't match. <laughs> Gentile clothes never matches. It never matches. They know this is their country, they don't have to impress you. You <laughs> You'll notice that a Jew dresses up even to take out the garbage. Get to. <laughs> I don't like to generalize about people, but Jews are the best dressers in the world. They are. They buy the best clothes, the best homes, the best cars, the best of everything. The only thing is, they get it for less. 
They spend their whole lives walking around. How much did you pay? Ha uh ha, -huh, I paid less. <laughs> I hope it doesn't sound like I'm making fun. Never make fun of people in a foreign country. I don't belong here, and you extend me a courtesy of being able to perform at your most important event. And I have, I'm very honored to be here. This is still a free country. Let's be honest, it's one of the few free countries in the world. It's not as free as America. Let's be honest, America is the freest country. O.J. Simpson proved that. <laughs> in this country, you're innocent or proven guilty, but in America, we go a step further. Not only are you innocent or proven guilty, but after you're proven guilty, you're still innocent. <laughs> Not that I hope it doesn't sound like I'm saying he's guilty. I have no right to say that or even imply that. Let's be honest about it. A court of law decided that the man is innocent. And I have no right to contradict it. It could be that he is innocent. It could be. It could also be that this building is in Philadelphia. <laughs> well, I better make it fast because I know your main big star is coming out. The singer. You know what I'm talking about? Huh? You don't know who's coming out? None of you know who's coming out? Tom Jones. Tom Jones. Your biggest star is coming out. He's going to sing. I don't know if anybody's going to listen, but they're going <laughs> to... Not unusual, it's not unusual. It's not unusual. Why is he shaking so much? <laughs> He's shaking so much, he must think it's unusual. I was with him in the dressing room. He was singing, it's not unusual. You know what? I took a good look. It wasn't unusual. <laughs> the man was right. People admire him because he's supposed to be so sexy. He's got a great body. What great body? He's got a crooked body. It goes like this. It goes like this. You see me? Quite good. No mistakes. But I don't make fun of a person who's such a great star. I pay tribute to great stars. I pay tribute to him. I pay tribute to Frank Sinatra. The greatest star in the world is Frank Sinatra today. Considered the greatest star probably of all time. Everybody says it. I say it too. I say it for the same reason that everybody says it. Because if you don't say it, you could get killed. <laughs> Before I go, I want to thank you very, very deeply and sincerely for being here. The kind of jokes I tell might make some people think that maybe I, uh, I could possibly offend anybody. I hope nobody would get that impression. Because I was making fun of the food. It's not nice. And I know you don't like those jokes. So I'm going to leave that out from now on. I'll just talk about the weather, how it stinks here, and that's it. <laughs> so the weather happens to be great here, but you can't find out it's great because when you watch a weather report, they tell you everything except the weather. I was going to find out if it's hot or cold before I came here. I didn't know if it was going to rain today or whole day. So I watched the weather report. I was dying to know, is it going to rain or not? Is it going to be hot or cold? They don't tell you. They do not tell you in this country what the weather is going to be. They call it a weather report, then a the guy comes out and tells you everything except the weather. There's a wind coming from Philadelphia, it's going through New Zealand. It's coming from Turkey, it's going around the mountains, it's going into an ocean. Is it going to rain or not? That's all I want to know. Is it, is it hot or cold? He won't tell you. It's coming, it's going. Who cares where it's coming from? Are you paying for the trip? Is it hot or cold? <laughs> they will not tell you if it's hot or cold. They tell you everything else. It's a high wind, a low wind, a low wind. You care if the wind is high or low? Does anybody care if it's high? You're going to walk like this? You're all dressed up and you can't get out of the house because they tell you information you don't want to know. The wind is northwest by southeast. Do you care? You ever walk out of your house wondering, oh, it's northwest? I'm going this way. <laughs> it's a high tide, a low tide. You got a boat in the living room? Do you care? <laughs> I love when they tell you the temperature at the airport. Who lives at the airport? Lately, there's a whole new thing. Have you people noticed that lately there's a whole new thing that they give you two temperatures? Have you noticed that? Two temperatures. It's 40 degrees. But with the wind chill factor, it's two. <laughs> and everybody is walking around. Is it 40 or is it two? Like, well, let's be honest about it. You hear two temperatures? You feel two temperatures? Who feels two temperatures? Either you feel 40 or you feel two. I never heard a guy say, I feel 40. But with the wind chill factor, I feel two. <laughs> It's like telling you it's raining, but without the rain, it's dry. <laughs> Get out.
as the sublime Eric Morecambe used to say to Amy Wise, follow that. Not easy, but possible. Here's the most redundant announcement I ever made. We keep a welcome in the hillside. We keep a welcome in the vale. Till he treads the green, green grass of home, the other Prince of Wales, Tom Jones. <laughs> It's not unusual to be loved by anyone. It's not unusual to have fun with anyone. But when I see you hanging about with anyone, it's not unusual to see me cry. I want to die. It's not unusual to go out at any time. It's such a crime If you should ever want to be loved by anyone It's not unusual It happens every day No matter what you say You find it happens all the time And love we never do What you want to do Why can't this crazy love It's not unusual to be mad with anyone It's not unusual to be sad with anyone But if I ever find that you've changed at any time It's not unusual to find that I'm in love with you Whoa, whoa, go, go, whoa, go, whoa, whoa, whoa.
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say it's great to be back once again to do yet another Royal Variety Show. You 
help of the Entertainment Artist Benevolent Fund and in the tradition of the Royal Variety Show, three cheers for His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip!